Welcome everybody to another edition of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited today to have our guest on, Evan Hagland. He's the U.S. Director of an organization called Wise Zambia. And today we're going to talk about something that Evan, in almost 700 episodes of the Nonprofit Show, doing this for three, three years, I don't think we've ever had this conversation. And that is, how do you work in a place like Africa but that you fundraise here in the US and what does that all look like? So we're really excited to have this conversation with you, but before we really get into it, I wanna introduce myself. If you don't know who I am, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I am not being joined today by the nonprofit nerd, Jarrett Ransom. She has a few days off. She'll be joining us back later in the week. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors. These are the amazing folks that allow us to have this conversation that we do with folks like Evan Hagland day in and day out. We want to extend our thanks to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. We also want to make sure that you know if how to get back to our archives. As I mentioned, we have our on pace right almost at about 700 episodes. And so if you want to find out um, or share any of our content, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, and Amazon Fire TV. You can also download us on wherever you like to get your podcast content. And again, share that with all the folks that you know. Okay, Evan Hagland, welcome back. I've done my housekeeping. Now it's all about you, my friend. All right. <laughs> you know, you have a very interesting story because I feel like you're such an educated man who didn't have any connection to Africa until all of a sudden you did. And it seems like it kind of changed your life. Could you share that story with us? Yeah, well, it actually started out with it with a police shooting here in Phoenix, which is not the normal way. A uh, Sudanese refugee was walking along I-17 here in Phoenix, was shot by a Department of Public Safety officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, his uncle came to the law firm I was working at at the time uh, to see if we wouldn't represent the family in a civil rights lawsuit against the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. We took it, we had a dash cam, it, we felt it was a strong case, but the his family was still in a refugee camp in northern Uganda, and someone had to go visit with the family, get background information. They had all the same rights as a client here in the U.S., so we need, had to make sure they understood all that. So someone had to go to the Aleri II refugee camp, 10 miles south of then Sudan, um, to, to visit with them. And at the time, the State Department advised against going to northern Uganda. So it was like, I'm not going, I'm not going. And all right, I went. Now, I want to make it clear, I'm not going with any philanthropic or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going, we want to make money on this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to that refugee camp. And I, I mean, it was a life-changing experience. First, I met with um, the... the um, the decedent's uh, father, Pastor David Abrigo, who is one of the, few, I'm still in touch with him. Uh, in, in in the middle of nowhere, he's giving back, he's running an orphanage, he's ministering to other, not only refugees, but Ugandans in the area. And it's like, I've never seen anyone in the U.S. give back the way this man is giving back to his community. And he's doing it with for, for no resources. Yeah. And, but just this whole situation and getting to know these people, I, I hate saying that sounded bad, but you know, the, the folks I was around and it, it was life changing. Sure. Talk to us about, first of all, where is Zambia and then what, why Zambia does and what your, your philanthropic mission is, if you will. Okay. Well, Zambia is a landlocked country in the Southern part of Africa. It's two countries north of South Africa. Okay. Um, it's absolutely an amazing country. Uh, the people, the the scenery, you know, um, I always say it has a lot of similarities with Arizona. 
Copper is their main uh, re natural resource. It's hot. They have one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Wow. It just seems like so. Like we have the Grand Canyon. They have Victoria Falls. So I feel kind of feel at home in Zambia. In terms of our our mission, which has evolved over the years, but I'm really very proud of what we have done, and we means mostly the people in Zambia. But you know, our our mission statement is kind of the normal, vague one that you get from nonprofits. We support <laughs> empowerment and economic independence for vulnerable children in Zambia through educational, vocational, and agricultural initiatives. That's the, quote, official mission statement. But the reality is we actually have five pillars. And what, the first of them is high-hanging fruit. We are working way out in the Western province, which is about the poorest area of Zambia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a fairly high child marriage rate. Much of the province has yet to be electrified. Mm -hmm. And so we're going into communities that are either underserved or in many cases, completely unserved. Mm. Um, the other, a key component is that we make long-term commitments to our students. You know, I see so many nonprofits that believe they have one year to accomplish anything and you, you, it's just not going to work. We begin working with students in the eighth grade when any even hope for um, formal education ends typically in the seventh grade in these rural areas. But we commit to our students, not just to get them out of the cycle of poverty, but actually to achieve their potential. And that's a, another one, no ceilings is what we call it. Um, I love that. I mean, that's a, a long view. I mean, I would imagine because of that, you're joining with these these kids and their families and their communities. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it sounds like it's a pretty in-depth um, piece. Go on and talk about your, your other pillars, because I interrupted you. Well, that that one's related to no ceilings. And I just, I, I, I was there and I went, one of the first schools we began working with was one called Noki. And literally, if you don't have a four wheel drive, you're not getting there. Mm -hmm. No student had ever be, um, gone beyond the seventh grade in this community's history, at least of which we're aware. And so we began um, providing opportunities. And this is a whole story that again, we don't have time, but. One of the first students that accepted one of our scholarships is now a public health nursing student at Luanaka Nursing School. And she's winning awards from the Zambian Nursing Association for the best grades in the country and the best performance. And I'm thinking the untapped human potential in these areas is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, we have students, again, from communities where the seventh grade was a cap, we're now studying civil engineering, um, biomedicine, um, environmental sciences, you know, education. And the whole idea is, again, to have them achieve their full potential. And I, it's hard to not, we're not trying to make little incremental changes, but, but that leads to the final, or, you know, and I kind of skipped in order, but, um, you know, giving back is one of our main pillars. Every one of our students commits to giving back to their families, their communities, and in fact, their country. We've had graduates who run for political office. We encourage civic participation. We even make sure the African version of The Economist is available at our office mm -hmm. for our students to read. Um, wow, I love that. I love that. So. Yeah. Evan, it's really interesting because um, I think a lot of times in philanthropy, we have this sense of we want to do good because we want to feel good. And it, it's like a drop in, drop out kind of thing. But it seems to me that you really, as an organization, um, are looking at this as a, a much deeper relationship and, and talking about leadership seems to be one of those things. How do you empower your African um, partners, students, participants to think that way? Um, because that's a pretty heavy lift. Well, we have, I think, 
I went, by the way, the photo I believe that's up is Maggie and Dopu, who is our Zambia director. And I want to make clear, she doesn't work for me or us. We actually have a separate organization, Why Zambia, registered under Zambian laws. And if anything, she's my superior. Uh -huh. I love um, it. But we do try to work together uh, because nothing is going to work if you don't have the buy, not just the buy-in, but the desire. You know, this is their country, not my country. Mm -hmm. Although I'm beginning to feel <laughs> fairly <laughs> Zambian myself. But uh, <laughs> um, but but it, we we've got a really good symbiotic relationship working, in my opinion. Um, because, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, Z Maggie's role is programming. And I can't tell you, she's on the ground. Like this year, we, we've reached kind of a critical number of 500 students going into 2023. And that's just in secondary school. As part of our model, all of our students go on to tertiary or post-secondary. And, um, you know, we've got over 50 and that number is going to grow dramatically in the next few years. So, but she's recognizing we have a need for mental health counseling for our students. So that's beginning in 2023. Um, she's recognizing the need, you know, the schools are really focused on teaching to the test. So we're trying to broaden and her, with her initiative, we've created a creative writing program to help expand by the way we've gotten 50 stories from our students i read them mesmerizing so that. that is some of the um things but there it's a symbiotic relationship because I'll, I'll give you an example i mentioned the student who's in luanaka she's actually getting a diploma in public health nursing and she's doing so well she mentioned to to, to maggie did you know you can get a bachelor's degree in uh, Maggie's, yeah. She goes, even a master's degree in public health nursing. Maggie's, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but sometimes we can add something, especially when you're dealing with people who've not had a whole lot of global perspective. So sometimes Maggie clearly knows the local environment and what is going on in the ground and what needs to be done there so much better. But every now and then we can provide a global perspective that helps in deciding, you know, one of the things we're concerned is you see the whole fourth industrial revolution coming on. What can we do to ensure that not only our students, but Zambia itself is prepared for what's going to be a, a serious industrial revolution within the world? You know, it's so interesting. I, one of the things that we say so much in my office is you only know what you know. And, and that is um, really impactful if you think about dealing with communities where the seventh grade is the highest level of education. And so then to work with, with people and help give them um, a different perspective or broaden their horizon is pretty interesting and probably um, somewhat daunting in order to let them reach their highest potential. It's a challenge. Yeah. Without question. I mean, there's so many, um, you know, one of the things we did is we took six of our students with leadership potential up to the World's Fair in Dubai in February. Interesting. A, a way to introduce wow. students to the whole world. Wow. Because we believe these students are going to be future leaders of Zambia. Yeah. Not just political, but in their yeah. different. And, right. you know, we're organizing field trips to things like the Lower Kafui Dam, where our students start thinking about how, how does our nation get its energy. We're going to go to the Lusaka International, the Kenneth Kwanda International Airport in Lusaka, just to kind of introduce the whole concept of transportation and sure. not just for, for careers, but just promoting knowledge and promoting curiosity. We're trying to create curiosity among our students. I love that. And that's something that we don't uh, talk about enough as a way to solve world problems as well. I mean, because you do have to be curious about other things, I think, in order to align with other people. And especially we see that in the philanthropic world. You know, I'm really interested um, to ask this next question. And, and I really want to spend more time on this. I love your work. I think you're doing the work of the angels. 
I get it. I think it's fabulous. But the reality is there's an argument to be made that we have issues and problems that need to be funded here on our own soil. How do we communicate or engage or build relationships so that donors here will care about something on a continent that frankly, most of them will never even visit or even if they know anybody who's even visited? How do you do that? Well, I would encourage everyone <laughs> to consider visiting Africa. Uh -huh. or Zambia in particular. It's absolutely gorgeous, but not that's beside, but now to get to your question. The reality is if we want to start solving global problems, mm -hmm. um, climate change, pandemics, supply chain issues, you name it, these problems are no longer within um, national borders. Mm -hmm. And the reality is these problems are not going to be solved without the input of leaders and thinkers from Africa. I mean, Bill Gates has a fantastic video that shows the population trends for the next 40 to 50 years. Africa is the youngest continent. North America's getting older, Europe's getting older, China's getting older, Japan's already old, you know, whereas the youth and 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 when you see the potential of these students you realize the res these are the people who are going to be solving our world's problems. If you really care about these issues, you can't think borders. Mm -hmm. Who is really working on getting the, you know, creating the scenarios to make our world a better place? Mm -hmm. and wow, Evan, I love that no matter what you do in philanthropy, I love that approach and wow, I don't believe that we've ever had anyone on the nonprofit show actually articulate that or draw those parallels. It's, it's a really interesting, interesting conversation to have because especially in the US where we're so state oriented, regionally oriented, and then we have so much uh, of a breakdown in civil you know, discourse. I mean, obviously we're we're talking about elections at this time of the year. It makes it even more stressful. Um, I've got to ask, how many of your donors or the conversations that you have where you lead with that, do people, I mean, can they go beyond that concept or are they like, wow, okay, I get it. I mean, cause that's pretty, that's a pretty bold way to get to the end product or end, end investment in Y Zambia. Well, and that is, that's our mission is to, as with anything, it clearly resonates with some. Mm -hmm. um, but coupled with that message, we're not talk, telling people to not think locally. I mean, yeah, yeah. I give locally. Sure. But, you know, I say just like your investment portfolio is diversified, mm -hmm. you need to diversify your philanthropic or your giving portfolio. It shouldn't be, and, and I will tell you, often you will find that in terms of actual impact for a dollar spent is greater when you give in developing nations versus here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, undoubtedly, the dollar must be incredibly powerful and go further in terms of, of where you're going. Well, I tell people, you know, $200 gets a student through, you know, right now, $3,000 would get a student from the eighth grade through college. That, in, in Zambia. I mean, you've literally changed a life for that amount of money. Not by, you know, where can you do that? I mean, and I say not just change a life, potentially change the world. Mm -hmm. Because each one of these, it's a ripple effect. Each one of our students will be giving back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're seeing that, by the way, even though our program being long-term, we're just now beginning to see the, the ripple effect, but it's working. Wow. Well, you know, it, it, it's such an interesting thing because if you think about, I keep going back to, uh, and I've never been to the African continent, but I, I go back to a community where somebody on, you know, nobody's, nobody's going past the seventh grade. And then you bring these people back with this education 
the impact's got to be really tremendous and and community altering and probably super tough probably super super tough you know definitely yeah but go ahead i'm in i interrupted you, you know i'm not i actually um in in this last trip i i made it back or i made it to noki the first community first time i've been there just because of the difficulty getting there mm -hmm. but we're seeing such initially there was some skepticism we only had three students take our scott up on our i call it educational empowerment program because it's far one of our pillars is 360 degree support it's not just a scholarship i mean it's mentoring counseling whatever it takes to get our students mm -hmm. to succeed but we went from three to every student in the school going leaving to go into boarding school about 100 kilometers away to the point where the Zambia Ministry of General Education says we can't have our dorms all plugged we're going to build a high school there I mean it's just we're we're seeing actual institutional change mm -hmm. and like say these students are going into nursing but we kind of have a problem. Many of them are going into nursing because that first student, Pelikilo, is kind of their role model now. And it's like, there are other things out there, guys. <laughs> I love it. I think that's fabulous. Well, you know, uh, healthcare, certainly, if, if we have learned nothing in the last, you know, 36, 48 months, I mean, this is, is a definite uh, field that we need to really support and increase. So I'm going to get you to get out your crystal ball and shine it up and tell me what you see for why Zambia going forward in like the next three to five years, because you travel to Africa twice a year, right? Right. But in the pandemic, you obviously had to pull back on that. But what are you seeing as we're coming out of this, going into other things? Do you have any sense of what's cooking i do okay. by the way they didn't miss me during the pandemic <laughs> that was was interesting they did just fine you know <laughs> um but uh 2023 should be a great year we right now we're in, our headquarters is in a, a community called kaoma and we work in the rural villages and three of the districts are kind of like counties for lack of a better Kaoma, uh, Kayama, and uh, the Luampa districts. But uh, starting in early 2023, we're going to open our first branch office in a new community in a very rural area. Um, and uh, like I say, we're starting both career guidance and mental health counseling for all of our students in 2023. It's been done on an informal basis, but we're creating a much more formalized program. We're actually for the career guidance, our, and I told you the giving back is part of our program. It's gonna be spearheaded by two, two of our um, students who just graduated this year. And they're going to come back and um, during off, you know, when they uh, will be present, going to all of our schools presenting career guidance programming for our, our students um, in, in secondary school. Uh, the other thing I'm very excited about is uh, we partnered with the philanthropic arm of HDR Engineering, one of the largest engineering firms in the world, and they helped us design a revolutionary school design. Now, we don't build schools, but we do need one on our campus for English tr um, training and whatever, but we believe this design, it's, it's just revolutionary using materials and whatever in Zambia but will greatly uh, improve the educational environment for students. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna do a model for that. Um, and we're hoping it catches on and you start seeing it throughout Zambia's Western province. And, wow. and, and we hope to not just be limited to the Western province at some point. Mm -hmm. so. You know, um, we're, our time is almost up and it's amazing because I, I have so many questions. Um, how old is Y Zambia? How old is your organization? We were actually founded in 2003. Oh, okay. But so um, the our, but we started as a women's empowerment program, mm -hmm. which was good. But in 2012, 
without there were some working with our folks in Zambia, we shifted it into more of an educational empowerment program. We've not given up on the women's empowerment in that we try to work with a 70-30 uh, or 75-25 kind of female to male ratio uh, in terms of students we, we support. But uh, so our program itself is probably about not quite 10 years old this year. Wow. And then um, only because we've chatted about this before off camera, you are the very, while well, you've been involved with Y Zambia for quite a while, you're the very first like official paid executive director, correct? Yes. So how do you think that's going to, you know, propel you forward? It seems like it's going to, you know, really put you um, on a quicker track moving forward. I, I'm certainly hoping so. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really hard. Every year we've expanded by like 50 students in our scholarship program. And we typically get between 1,200 and 1,500 applications Oof. for 50 spots. Oof. And uh, this trip was actually at a, a, an economic development expo in Mongu, Western Province. And literally every district leader came, when are you coming to our district? When are you coming to our district? So if I can do my job, a big F perchance, but <laughs> it's not like the need isn't there. Um, and oh, I, last story, I don't know where we are in time, but I, I actually had the opportunity to speak with the district administrator for the Kaoma district. And we had a one-on-one -on -one talk for about 30 minutes. And he's just saying, you know, when you're working out in a developing area of the country, you see quite a few NGOs. Mm -hmm. Um, and he goes, but I don't often see results. Wow. And he says, wow. Um, with, with, with Y Zambia, I'm saying I can point to results. I see them. I see students graduating. I see students going on to college. And by the way, this isn't just him talking. He actually, unfortunately, he swings by with more people. Help this person. Help this person. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So wow. we're hoping to get a videotaped interview with this uh, gentleman in the near future just to show, you know, the support we're getting from the uh the local government. Amazing. Well, you know, it, it's been um, really cool to talk with you, Evan Hagland, Executive Director, um, U.S. Executive Director of Y Zambia. Um, I love, love, love your, your own personal origination story and connection to philanthropy. I think that's super powerful. And uh, we need to get you back on later in 2023 to find out what some of your lessons are and, and how things are going, because it's really an exciting opportunity to see how um, organizations can flourish and, and do better for all of us in a global capacity. So thank you, Evan, so much for being on the nonprofit show today. Check out WISE, W-I-S-E, Zambia, Z-A-M-B-I-A dot org. Their website is amazing, and um, Evan has a fabulous blog post about turning a certain age um, and how his birthday um, impacted his notion of gift giving and, and phases of life. It's, a, it's really a powerful story. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. You will see Jarrett Ransom back with us in just a couple of days. And we want to make sure that we thank all of our presenting sponsors who allow us to have these amazing conversations. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Your Part-Time Controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit, uh, excuse me, yeah, Nonprofit uh, Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. Hey, Evan Haglund, you've really inspired me. You've started me off in a great way for the week. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. Appreciate it's, you having me uh, share, share. Yeah, it's been great. Keep up the good work. I love so much of what you said today. I think there's so many parts of it that we can all learn from. And as we like to end every episode, I want to remind our viewers, our listeners, our guests, ourselves to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.